Thank you very much, Mrs. Davies. Um, I just want to say a couple of things before I get started. One, I'm presuming that uh, almost all of you or most of you anyway are on your way to Rome. So I envy you. Uh, UD is a community of either those dreaming about going or dreaming about having been or dreaming about having been and hoping to go again. I would like to concede something. Uh, I'm neither a theologian, though we've got one in the house, so if I have any questions, I'll just ask Professor Norris. I'm neither a theologian nor an art historian. Um, I'm just an English teacher who uh, loves to read the Bible and look at pictures, uh, which is what I'm going to be doing uh, today. Reading Michelangelo, reading the Bible, image and story on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Beauty creates, without itself satisfying, the aspiration for certitude. On October 31st, 1512, Michelangelo's finally completed Sistine Chapel ceiling was unveiled. And Giorgi Vasari tells us in the lives of the artists that all of Rome came to see it. O oh, truly happy age of ours, O oh, blessed artist, for you must call yourselves fortunate since in your lifetime you have been able to rekindle the dim lights of your eyes from a source of such clarity, to see everything that was difficult made simple by such a marvelous and singular artist. He has removed the blinders from the eyes of our minds so full of shadows and has shown you how to distinguish the true from the false that clouded your intellect. Therefore, thank heaven for this and strive to imitate Michelangelo in all things. For Vasari, imitating Michelangelo is imitating nature because Michelangelo has imitated nature so well that he is almost a second creator. He is, quote, something divine rather than mortal, he claims. In fact, he comes close to proclaiming that the artist is a second incarnation, at least a new prophet, quote, a man sent by God into the world, end quote, as an example of moral, intellectual, and artistic perfection. What did all of Rome see that day? What sight could so arouse Vasari's latent paganism that he could conceive of Michelangelo as an artistic god? All Rome saw what one still sees when straining to see the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with one's head bent upward, disoriented by the physical effort of contortion. an artistic complexity so bright and varied that it's overwhelming. I actually find it difficult to pay attention to the painting while I'm in the chapel and find it easier when looking, uh, looking at books. You'll, those of you who haven't been yet will see it's, it's a bit overwhelming. Only by patient attention can one begin to discern the patterns in the ceiling, the patterns which establish the work's complex harmony. Harmony, though, is not identical to unity. The ceiling is harmonic, but as one sees how Michelangelo reads the Bible, sees how story becomes image, one begins to see tensions in the harmony. My thesis is this. The ceiling has a theological program, one which must be understood in terms of the typology that attempts to fuse the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament into a unified account of Christian salvation. However, that theological program is in creative tension with another artistic program, one whose interest in classical beauty challenges Christian doctrine, since the beauty of Michelangelo's perfect bodies is not easily reconcilable with the Christian meta-narrative of the fall. If, as Matthew Arnold would have it, the culture of the West is defined by the relationship between the Hebraic and the Hellenic, think of it as Jerusalem and Athens, and Michelangelo's early modern Sistine Chapel ceiling enacts that relationship. Michelangelo is a Christian humanist, and the humanist's fascination with the body is in a dialectical relationship with the Christian theology of the body. As you will have learned from theology, of course, typology is a method of interpreting the Bible, a biblical hermeneutic. Augustine explains it clearly, quote, the New Testament is hidden in the old, the old is made clear by the new. In Christian typology, one discerns God's logos by means of the types which occur and recur in both testaments. For example, Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac in the Hebrew Bible is a type for the father's willingness to sacrifice the son in the New Testament. 
The Sistine Chapel ceiling's exclusive focus on Old Testament narratives can be read typologically. Even so, there's a great deal that cannot be easily read typologically, especially one feature. When Michelangelo's fascination with a classical pagan ideal of beauty challenges that typological reading. As Dante's love of Virgil creates a tension between classical fate and Christian freedom in the comedy, so Michelangelo's love of classical sculpture creates a tension between classical beauty and Christian goodness on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I'm not arguing that one undermines the other. I'm not trying to deconstruct the, the, the painting. I'm just trying to show a tension within its harmonic whole. Instead, I'm arguing that both are present in a tense harmony which requires us to ask a question very important to the University of Dallas Rome program. Is classical beauty commensurate with Christian goodness? If so, what third term might measure both in relationship to one another? I started thinking about this question while in Rome because I noticed that a great many students were scandalized by the art that they were seeing continually. I mean, not to put too fine a manner on it, there are just a lot of naked people in the art. And a lot of students, I think, find themselves slightly, slightly uncomfortable. And the question is, is that right to be uncomfortable or is it not right to be uncomfortable? That's really Michelangelo's question. There are three parts to the presentation. A general explanation of the full theological program of the ceiling. A detailed explication of the central panels on the vault, during which we'll read Michelangelo reading Genesis. Especially the central triad of panels concerning Adam and Eve. And three, a discussion of the annuity, the adult male nudes who frame and comment upon that Genesis narrative. I think especially during part one, the handout, will be very helpful, especially the, the side that has the diagram. It's a little difficult to rush back and forth between slide images. The ceiling, hold on here. The ceiling is not actually as architectural as it appears. Although the lunettes, spandrels, and pendatives are actual features of the chapel's architecture, the rest of the apparent architecture is fictional. Michelangelo paints the ceiling to look as though the central panels are framed by stone, not fresco. This painting within a painting technique allows him to paint figures whose substantiality has a grade. The scenes within the lunettes, spandrels, pendatives, and the panels are painted as paintings. The caryatids are painted as sculpture. The prophets, sibyls, and inuti are actually painted as though they were live figures. So Michelangelo's fictive architecture allows him to represent three orders of being, those of paint, those of stone, and those of flesh. Within the fictive architecture, there are four acts of the Christian meta-narrative of salvation, from creation to the birth of Christ. First, within the central panels, there's Michelangelo's reading of three episodes from Genesis, creation, Adam and Eve, and Noah. We'll look at these in detail in a moment, especially the Adam and Eve panels. Not yet. Second, in the four corners or pendatives, there are four episodes of liberation from tyranny with two male and two female liberators. David and Goliath, Judas and Holofernes, Moses and the brazen serpent, and the death of Haman. Typologically, Moses and David are types for Christ, Judith and Esther for Mary, and the church. Third, along both the north and south sides of the ceilings, central panels, are pagan sibyls and Hebrew prophets, both of whom in a typological reading foresee the coming of the Messiah. Zacharias, it's across from Jonah, Joel from the Delphic Oracle, Isaiah from the Erythrean Sibyl, Ezekiel from the Cumaean Sibyl, Daniel from the Persian Sibyl, and Jeremiah from the Lib Libyan Sibyl. The juxtaposition of pagan Sibyl and Hebrew prophet extends the typological horizon of interpre interpretation. 
not only to the Hebrew stories of the Old Testament, but also to the literary texts of the classical tradition. And this should be, I think, quite apparent to those of you who are students of Dante. It looks at times as though Virgil himself is a kind of prophet, although uh, quite, quite limited, uh, as his uh, uh, location in limbo should, should indicate. Christ then is foreseen not only, not only by Jew, but also by the Greek and the Roman. Fourth and last, in the Lunettes and Spandrels, there are ancestors of Christ. Those Old Testament figures cited in Matthew's genealogy of Christ's line all the way back to David, images which emphasize all of them child rearing. The four acts of the Christian meta-narrative from creation to the birth of Christ provide, within a typological reading, a unified story of universal salvation. God the Father creates a world which, through the human failures of Adam and Eve, then Noah, falls only to be redeemed by the Father's incarnation as the Son, an incarnation prefigured in Hebrew liberation and prophesied by Hebrew and Hellenic seers, an incarnation which brings to historical fulfillment the human genealogy from Adam to Christ who is at the center of the Last Judgment. The Last Judgment, of course, is Michelangelo's later fresco, which completes his work on the chapel and which resides behind the altar in the chapel right below the very first image of creation and meets beginning and knows it for the first time. Let me return to the first act of the narrative and examine Michelangelo as a reader of Genesis as one turning story into image. According to Michael Buxendahl in Painting and Experience in the 15th century in Italy, a painter from early modern Italy was, quote, a professional visualizer of the holy stories. He turned biblical story into image. This artistic act is not mere illustration. To visualize is to interpret, because in deciding which episodes to visualize, in deciding which exact moment to visualize, and in deciding how to visualize, the artist rereads the text, interprets it. Think of a storyline as just that, a line, one which, on which reside any number of points which can become an image. To make an obvious large point, Michelangelo chooses not Abraham as his patriarch after Adam, but instead Noah. And each panel is the result of a highly focused selection of one visual moment or point in a narrative continuum of line. Early modern painters are not mere recorders of holy narrative. They are at least emphasizers of it, perhaps even remakers of it. And by the way, I, I will say that uh, the, the argument that I would make beyond just the argument about the, the ceiling is that really there are two texts that will help you with all of the visual art that you'll see. One is the Bible and the other is Ovid's Metamorphoses. I think if you were to empty all of the museums in Europe of art based on those two texts, there'd be a lot less art. Uh, both of those texts are actually quite, quite helpful. But in particular, for those of you who are lovers of the Bible, it's fascinating to pick stories and then see how different artists take them up. My own favorite is the Annunciation. Uh, I've never seen an Annunciation that didn't rework uh, uh, Luke's account in very, in very interesting, uh, interesting ways. So it's worth taking, uh, uh, if you will, your, your Bibles with you. It will, it will bring out a good deal of what's being done in the art that you'll see back to Michelangelo. In his selection of episodes from Genesis, in the exact moments he chooses to represent, and in his emphases, he isolates and investigates three topics. The human body, especially the unashamed naked body, God as the artist of that natural body, and the relationship between God as the fashioner of natural bodies and Michelangelo as fashioner of artistic ones. Michelangelo reads Genesis as an artist whose primary interest, indeed, the object of his obsession, is the human body. Reading him, reading the Bible, as we try to understand how he turns story into image, we will see that it matters who reads the Bible. There is no reader from nowhere. And this particular reader from somewhere brings with him his own central concerns. Like Dante, like Milton, Michelangelo rewrites what he reads. There are nine central panels, 
Within Michelangelo's simulated architecture, all the other scenes provide an elaborate frame for them. They're the highest point of the vaulted ceiling. The nine panels of Act One are divided into three scenes, each scene having three sequences. Notice that Michelangelo is selecting a key point in each storyline. Scene one is composed of God's creation of the cosmos and the world. Scene two of his creation of Adam and Eve. And their temptation and fall. Scene three of the second Adam, Noah, and his survival of the flood, his first sacrifice, and his own fall. Each scene is composed of three panels. Scene one of two small and one large. Scene two of two large and one small. And scene three of two small and one large. Remember as well that he painted them in the order opposite to their narrative sequence. So this is very important. So the Noah stories come later in, in narrative sequence, but he painted them first and he was, working, he was working back. For purposes of time and focus, allow me to concentrate on scene two, the three panels of Adam and Eve. They're the most important, I presume, both because they're at the center and because it's the only scene with two large panels. Panel one gives us the creation of Adam, panel two, that of Eve, and panel three, that of Adam and Eve's temptation, fall, and expulsion from Eden. Michelangelo begins the second scene with God's creation of Adam, taking the second account of the creation of humankind in Genesis, the first Adam, then Eve one. I'll use the KJV, the King James Version uh, of the Bible, since it remains the most beautiful English translation of the Bible, though theologians uh, say that it's full of uh, important mistakes and even, I hear, heresies. Um, but it's still the most beautiful Bible in the English language, says the English professor. Michelangelo knew the Bible in a recent Italian translation and probably in the Latin Vulgate. But in English, quote, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. What does Michelangelo choose to represent and how? God has apparently just made Adam from dust, but either not yet or just breathed the breath of life into him. That infusion of breath here represented as touch, finger to finger. Reclining in a languorous pose, Michelangelo's Adam is a bodily form, either without yet a living soul or just now with one. Is God reaching toward that touch or retreating from it? It's difficult to tell. But if Adam is only body, but not yet soul, he is then a kind of statue. Michelangelo thought of himself first and foremost as a sculptor, not a painter. And there is a sculpture-like quality to his figures. Here, he may be thematizing his own sculptural activity. Michelangelo's God is a sculptor of human form, just given or yet to be given, animating soul. He's a kind of Michelangelo, who, after all, fashioned from stone material, forms which seem to be animated by soul. Think only of his David. Through his career, Michelangelo was impressed by the Ovidian trope of the moving statue one encounters in the Pygmalion tale, i.e. he's animated by the fantasy that the statue can actually become living. The point in the story Michelangelo chooses is ambiguous, but it takes place as near as possible just before or just after the singular point of the first ensouled human form. Let me go back for a moment. Notice that this God discloses his own bodily form to view, a visual representation of the first Genesis account of creation, quote, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. This God has a body. He's not naked, but his clothing is tight and his ancient musculature is visible, strained at moments of creation. Right? I mean, Michelangelo's father is pretty buff. Uh, 
Michelangelo represents God, that is, he imitates he who made the nature to be imitated. Between Dante's reticence in not representing God directly in the comedy, see Canto 100, and Milton's brazenness in doing so in Paradise Lost, Michelangelo takes the Miltonic path. He represents him directly. In Michelangelo's Genesis, as he transforms biblical story into papal image, Adam's body in the image of God's is a perfect body, the body before the fall of the world. Yet Michelangelo himself paints both essentially perfect forms of God and its Adamic likeness. How, though, can a post-fallen human being, a Michelangelo on the other side of the fall, imagine pre-fallen bodies in their shameless perfection? The next panel assists us. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Pre-fallen bodies, perfect bodies, were not only free from age and disease and death, according to the Genesis account, they were free from the self-consciousness of shame. Quote, and they both were naked and were not ashamed. And it's in the next panel that we begin to see that Michelangelo suggests that the fall did not make the body a form to be ashamed of, even if it can be ravaged by time. The painting's composition is very interesting since the tree of knowledge literally separates paradise from exile. And as I read the account, observe all that Michelangelo includes from the story, all that he excludes from the story, and all that he in some way alters. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat from every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye there eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? The man said, The woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Not Adam's most gallant moment. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? And the woman said, Much less evasively than her husband, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. 
And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. God hasn't quite gotten over, uh, uh, over what Adam's done. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You will yourself have noticed any number of points on the story uh, and its storyline of chapter 3 in Genesis. Things that Michelangelo subtracted, added, or altered. But I'd like to stress the fact that he de-emphasizes the shame of their nakedness. There is no interview with God. Who told thee thou wast naked? After which, in the biblical account, he makes them clothes. And, of course, they begin their exile without clothes. That seems to me to be a fairly significant revision. Although Adam and Eve are clearly marked by time and sorrow already, they reveal no shame in their nakedness. They're not clothed, and neither one covers genitals or face, both visual signs of shame in early modern paintings, according to Buxendahl. Compare Michelangelo's expulsion with Masaccio's in the Brancacci Chapel, a painting Michelangelo knew quite well, where Adam covers his face and Eve both her breasts and her genitals. Michelangelo's Adam and Eve leave in sorrow and fear, but they are not shamed. They are not ashamed of their nakedness. In his Genesis, the fall brought death, not shame. A typological reading cannot, I believe, read away Michelangelo's revision of the Bible. The central panels of Michelangelo's Genesis inaugurate a topic which Michelangelo explores throughout the ceiling. Is the naked body, the fallen naked body, shameful? Is its beauty, a beauty made by the Creator himself, undermined by sin? Or is it somehow in its freedom from shame perfectly, if only temporarily, beautiful? Is beauty incarnation? Or is beauty vanity? Does it lead to or from the divine. Is beauty incarnation or is beauty vanity? We might be better able to answer that question by examining that part of the ceiling which is not at all part of its theological program, the Inuti, the 20 male nudes framing Michelangelo's Genesis. You may have seen such fellows in his earlier work, for example, in the Holy Family. I find this a really startling painting. At first, when you look at it, you think, oh, lovely, Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus. Who are all the naked dudes in the back? <laughs> in his biography of the artist, Howard Hibbert says that the Inuti are particularly expressive of Michelangelo's intent and character, quote, expressions of Michelangelo's unique artistic daimon. They are, quote, his most personal and revealing contribution to the ceiling, having no necessary function. By the way, they serve no necessary function in the, in the painting of the Holy Family either, as far as I can tell. I don't remember that episode from Matthew. Do you, Professor Norris? <laughs> No necessary function within, one assumes, its theological program. But my argument is that the complex harmonics of the ceiling are characterized by a tension between that theological program and Michelangelo's own 
artistic program, his obsession with classical ideals of beauty. While Michelangelo is in Rome, remember, the Romans are discovering classical sculpture in the earth itself. They're actually digging it right out of the ground. For example, the Belvedere Torso. As one witness, Francesco de Sangal, put it, on the day the torso came out of the ground, quote, then they dug the hole wider so that they could pull the statue out. As soon as it was visible, everyone started to draw, all the while discoursing on ancient things, end quote. Michelangelo was there. Check out the abs on this guy. Same abs. There they are again. I'm envious. The Anudi are his painted torsos, his imaginative reconstructions of that fragmentary piece into 20 whole beautiful young men who frame creation. Each of the smaller panels is surrounded by four Anudi who sit upon fictive blocks of stone. So when you first look at it, you, you see the central panel. It's only later you realize that it's framed by these other, these other figures. What one notices is that they grow increasingly larger as Michelangelo progresses so that by the time one gets to the first scene of creation, they are at least as large as God. So around Noah, they're actually a little bit smaller and then they start to get bigger and bigger as he paints. Indeed, by then, it's arguable that they begin to crowd him out. The framing in Udi obscure the central deity. Now, the Udi are beautiful, but their beauty is Hellenic, not Hebraic. And its beauty is only Christian with the early modern fascination with classical beauty. So notice, the classical beauty that's re rediscovered is rediscovered by those who are Christian. So it starts to take on a Christian character. But it is, of course, arguably of another character as well. Michelangelo appropriates the pagan homoerotic beauty of classical sculpture and uses it to frame images from Genesis. These images themselves influenced by such classical beauty. Just remember how buff uh, uh, God the Father himself uh, is. Some art historians evade the character of the Anudi with safe discussions of angels. Right? The Anudi are angels. All I can say is, these aren't your mother's angels. In fact, they may be a problem theologically, or if they're your mother's, if they are your mother's angels, interesting mom, but also, <laughs> these aren't your grandmother's angels. In fact, they may be a problem. This supposal, by the way, is not anachronistic. This is not just a contemporary English professor who grew up in California distorting uh, the, the ceiling. In fact, a contemporary of Michelangelo's, Pietro Aretino, devotes, devotes a portion of one of his dialogues to the following exchange over Michelangelo's Inuti. And one of the characters actually complains about them. Who will be daring enough to affirm that it is proper that in Rome, in the church of St. Peter, the chief of the apostles in Rome, where all the world assembles in the chapel of that high priest who is the representative of God on earth, figures should be seen who immodestly discover what decency conceals. A thing in truth utterly unworthy of that most holy place. To which his interlocutor replies, quote, Sound eyes, my friend? are incorrupt and unoffended by seeing natural objects. So my focus was one from the ceiling's very first reception. Savonarola ought to be a reminder that not all early modern Christians applauded the introduction of classical humanism into their culture. Perhaps the dialogue's last speaker is right, though. The figures are beautiful, natural objects, nudes without shame, the enjoyment of which need arouse no shame in us. Indeed, Michelangelo goes even further. In one of his sonnets, he explains his love for Tommaso Cavaliere in Neoplatonic terms thus, I see in your beautiful face, my Lord, what in this life words cannot well describe. With it, my soul, still clothed in flesh, has already risen to God. L'anima della carne ancor vestita. Con esso e gia più volte accesa a Dio. A body's potentially ideal beauty 
even in its classical form, is a simulacrum of the perfection of the resurrected body. Beauty is incarnation. Perhaps then the Inuti are commensurate with the theological program of the Sealing's biblical stories, provided we see Hebrew narrative, Christian typology, and Neoplatonic beauty all participating in his early modern vision. Beauty then is divine. Perhaps they are not commensurate though. The male nude is Michelangelo's favorite object of artistic interest, even love, as he confesses in another sonnet, quote, Love takes me and beauty binds me. L'amour me prenda e la belta me lega. The body's actual beauty is a perfection of an earthly body, after all. Only earthly. Beauty, then, is only human. Does Michelangelo believe that beauty is divine and therefore eternal? Or does he believe that it is human and therefore finite? Perhaps what dissolves the tension within the harmony of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is incarnation itself. Christ's body is both human and divine. And because it is both human and divine, and because it's his, one presumes it's the perfect male body, as Mary's is the perfect female one. Yet as we see in his Pietà, Michelangelo is not very interested in Mary's body. She's, she's clothed. He's interested in Christ's, and he's interested in it at the very moment he's given his perfect body to death in order to free humankind from death. One can see in one of his drawings, in fact, one can see in one of his drawings that he imagines Christ's resurrected body as one of the inuti. Christ's body is, for Michelangelo, the perfect nude. In, in conclusion, I'd like to turn to a later piece of sculpture, one of the unfinished pieces. Why didn't Michelangelo finish some of his later pieces? By the way, these are the pieces that actually you walk past as you process toward the David. It's really quite wonderful because the David is about as finished as you can imagine. Um, but then you walk past these pieces that are uh, intriguingly incomplete. Why didn't Michelangelo finish some of these later pieces? One hears that it was because the stone was flawed or that he was called away to other commissions. And both of these reasons may very well be true. But are there other reasons, perhaps? Does he become ashamed of the body in his old age? One can surely see that in the Last Judgment, the bodies have lost their delicacy and become somewhat torpid. And remember, it's a later work, and you can, you can see that the bodies actually have lost a kind of vibrancy that Michelangelo's uh, artistic bodies had earlier when he was younger. The body becomes more and more of a problem the older that you get. For most of you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And I'm sorry, uh, but you will. <laughs> Does he become ashamed of the body in his old age? Does he grow frustrated that even perfectly sculpted or painted bodies decay? Because remember, of course, remember the statues that are being recovered in Rome were fragments. Their beauty becoming dust. The Belvedere torso, remember, is just a piece of what it once was. Or does he hope to represent that very process of the birth of form from dust and the death of form into dust, from dust to dust, body or image? I would choose the last option. One cannot tell in these late pieces if the form is emerging from or declining into matter, from or to dust. Are these bodies being born like Adam, under the touch of God the Father? Or are they dying under the curse of Adam and Eve by the Father? One old man the finest artist of the male body in the world, decides in his own decline to represent the very mystery of the Christian faith. The death of the perfect body raises imperfect bodies into perfection.
I'm going to repeat that line because I myself find it really quite amazing. The death, not because it's my line, but because of what it's describing. The death of the perfect body raises imperfect bodies into perfection. For Michelangelo, throughout his career, as a reader of the stories of the Bible and a maker of images from them, for Michelangelo, that is the perfectly beautiful body of our mysterious world. We have about five to eight minutes. Um, it's said four till five, but of course mass is at five o'clock, um, and so I'm thinking of 4:50 as the as the time at which we're supposed to conclude. So about five to eight minutes for uh, for questions or or comments. This is an actual death mask, apparently. Uh, Michelangelo. So it's probably a pretty decent likeness. <laughs> Questions, comments? There's the drawing of, uh, of the resurrection of Christ. past the NUD. Was there something in particular you were looking for? Yeah, they, they tend to get a little a little bulkier. If, if for example, uh, this isn't big enough, unfortunately. If one looks at the image of of Christ uh, as judge, you just notice that he's just a little bit thicker. He's not as he doesn't have quite the lovely animation that he does, for example, in the in the Pieta, for example, or even interestingly, even that drawing of the resurrection of Christ's body. Um, but generally, they tend just to be a little bit, they're still muscular because Michelangelo just loves muscles. Uh, I mean, the guy missed his age, no doubt about it. Um, other questions, comments? Yes? Uh, I had a question actually about like, the muscles. Uh huh. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can answer them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's definitely got biceps there. Hold on. Go, go ahead. Is that true? I didn't. I I didn't know that. Yeah, I've tended to think that Michelangelo's women are like Jane Austen's men. <laughs> like, like. Like not really. <laughs> Jane Austen is actually fast becoming sacred text at UD. You can't say anything <laughs> against her without people thinking you're a heretic. I love the novels, don't get me wrong, but there's not a male character in there. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it, that would be my response. He draws women like they're men. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know uh, that there were no uh, female, female models allowed. So, so I guess he's actually painting male figures and then imagining that they're women. Maybe. Uh, no, that, no, that's very, no, that's very interesting. That's almost Shakespearean. Um, yeah, very good. So that would be my take. He, he has a, a fondness for the male, the male physique. Uh, so all the the, because I mean there's no way around it. I mean I'll try to be discreet here, but um, she's pretty buff too. <laughs> Questions, comments. 
Good. Other uh, questions, comments? I mean, the long and short of it is I think the only way to reconcile the theological program with the artistic program is through the third term of the incarnation. I think Michelangelo is deeply and profoundly Christian and that although it might appear to be scandalous, as it did appear to some in his own age, that this is what's actually on the ceiling of the chapel of chapels um, of the Roman Catholic world is actually very appropriate, um, at least to me. Yes? So, so we've got the serpent here, and then, uh, let me see, so, yeah, and then at a certain point it becomes who or what. This is clearly the angel, right, expelling them. This has got, he's handing it to them. So at that point you're thinking, is that some kind of an attendant, sort of apple hander, um, or are you actually looking at the serpent. What was your reading? Oh, physically. Oh, I love it. So he of forked tongue has forked tail. Uh, yeah, very... Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I, so you're thinking of it as this one, this is a leg, and then here's another leg. Oh yeah, very nice, very nice, and then they come together. Well done. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, well done. I, this, oh, go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think it's a very, it's a very nice observation so that uh, there's a kind of paradox that they have an austere surrounding when they're perfect, but a more lush one when they're not. Yeah, very nice observation. Yes? Uh-huh. Oh, very nice. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you're thinking about that really as their perception, that if you will, prior to the fall, they had a more austere disposition toward the physical world, and then later their disposition is more sensual. That's, that's a really compelling, that's a really compelling and very interesting very interesting reading. I do find it, uh, the, the composition of this painting I find amazing, um, but it is worth pointing out that so, uh, it can't be because he's reticent about representing God because he's already done it uh, all over the ceiling, but he's not, he's not present here, which is really quite, really quite interesting. He omits that episode, which I think uh, accentuates or emphasizes what I'm trying to say is that once you go to visualize a story, it becomes, in fact, uh, another another story, related and often a commentary upon, but distinct uh, in it in itself. Very nice, very nice observation. Let's we'll see if we have time for more. Time for one more question. Yes. I believe it was part of the program that he was given um, because of the paintings that are actually, uh, Christ is actually represented down below in earlier paintings around, uh, uh, around the chapel. So the program is then calling for, for Old Testament. But of course we did get, remember, the ancestors of him 
Um, hence the typological reading that these uh, Hebrew biblical figures are uh, typologically pointing, pointing forward. I don't have any images of that, but if you actually do, uh, if, you, if you do Google this, what you'll find is that there are a number of paintings along, um, not on the ceiling, but there are two orders below in which Christ, uh, Christ is represented directly. Good. Well, uh, we have run out of time. Thank you so much for giving me your afternoon. For those of you who are going to Rome in the spring, have a magnificent time. <laughs>